I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Before we get into the questions today, we've got two real quick points to make. Uh, the first one, we've gotten some questions on what the cutoff time is for questions to make the next week's show. What I try to do is have the questions compiled by Friday so I can shoot the episode Friday evening. And then that gives me two days to get it edited and uploaded so you guys can see it Monday. So if you can get your questions in to me before Thursday evening, that would be great. Uh, that gives us plenty of time to go through them, select the ones, get them answered, and get them ready for the show. Uh, secondly, by popular demand, if you take a look down in the bottom in the comments section, you'll notice that we have links to each one of the questions throughout the uh, show. Now, if you're jumping on this as soon as we upload it, then the links may not be there in the description. It takes me a few minutes to go through it and do the uh, uh, times and get the other uh, annotations uploaded. So if, if you're getting to it right as soon as it's done processing, they may not be there, but if you're patient, um, usually sometime Monday I'll get in there and add the uh, index marks and add the annotations. So without further ado, let's get to our first question. Our first question comes off of YouTube from Stealth Shooter 100. He asks, I have a Remington 700 Varmint 308 that's my project rifle. I was wondering if you thought it's worth it to put a muzzle brake on the stock barrel. I'm going to get one of the Surefire brakes. I think the total cost on installation is around 250 Thanks for the great vids. I love Monday now. Well, Stealth Shooter, I'm glad that we can uh, entertain you on Mondays. Um, there's a couple of things that I would look at if I'm trying to decide whether to have some work done on a barrel. Uh, first and foremost, how old is the barrel? How many rounds does it have through it and how much life does it have left? If you're talking about a 308, 308s have quite a bit of barrel life on them. They can go quite a few rounds before they need to be replaced. So if you're only a couple thousand rounds into that barrel, then it's got plenty of barrel life left in it. It's not going to hurt you to invest a little money in it. Um, the uh, second thing is, how's the barrel shooting now? If the barrel's shooting exceptionally now, you may not want to mess with it. You may want to keep it just the way it is. Um, the last thing is, what kind of shooting are you doing? Uh, are you doing a type of shooting that would necessitate a muzzle brake? If all you're doing is shooting prone or shooting off of a bench, and you're able to set your position up and get straight behind the rifle, then a brake on a 308 is not really going to help you all that much. In fact, it may actually hinder you a little bit because it can mask other problems. Uh, a brake is better used in competition type shooting where the due to the stage or the way it's set up you may not be able to get straight behind the rifle. You may be offset to one side, you may be using some kind of uh, barricade or a port that you're trying to shoot through, or you may have something really uh, crazy that you're hanging off of. I've seen truss setups or stair steps and all kinds of things. Um, in those type of situations, a muzzle brake will help lessen the recoil and aid your ability to stay on target and spot your impacts. Um, so if you're shooting that kind of stuff, a muzzle brake's great. Um, if it's a tactical type situation for a law enforcement shooter, um, brakes are good in far, as far as keeping you on target. However, brakes also create a new problem with uh, noise and with muzzle flash. So you got to kind of balance those out and keep those in mind. Crazy Mofo asks, was curious what ammo manufacturers you prefer or recommend? Also, does steel case ammo affect anything other than the price of said ammo? Videos are a bit long, but I don't mind much since they're filled with good info. I'd say you probably want to stick in the 15 to 30 minute range, though. You deserve a lot more views than you get, by the way. Well, Crazy Mofo, um, thanks for the comments on the show. Uh, I think we're going to keep the length of it about where we're at now. Uh, we got kind of split comments uh, one way or the other, but I think the vast majority of people were satisfied with the show length as it is. Um, we don't have anybody cracking a whip here. We don't have any airtime constraints. So if we run a little over, we run a little over. Hopefully the, the index of questions at the bottom will help you guys uh, navigate through the show a little bit better and bypass the stuff that you don't really want to watch. Um, as far as your second question on ammo, uh, we've been partial to Black Hills 175 grain match ammunition. 
Uh, Black Hills helps us out and supplies some ammunition for some of our tests and some of our uh, different uh, rifle projects. So uh, it's, uh, it's exceptional ammunition. It's very accurate. I've shot both the 168 grain match and the 175 grain match versions, and they shoot well in just about everything I've tried it in. Uh, we recently did a Bobro quick release test, which we'll be uh, airing a little bit later this week. And you can see in that video that the ammunition performed very well and allowed us to be very accurate on the test. Um, there are several other uh, great ammo manufacturers out there. Hornady and Federal both make some great stuff, uh, as long as some uh, smaller companies that we haven't got into, but we've gotten great reports back on. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to go through and uh, do some ammo comparisons a little bit later on. But if you stick with Black Hills, Federal, or Hornady, um, their match loadings are going to function well and they're going to get you some great results. Soul Capacitor asks, what kind of pistol do you carry for LE work along with your rifle and why did you choose it? I've got my uh, work handgun right here. This is a Glock 21 slim frame. It's got a couple of quick additions. It's got a um, Hogue over molded grip on it, just one of the slip on grips, and a Viridian. Uh, C5L uh, laser light on it gives me a nice little uh, green laser and uh, pistol light there in a compact form. Uh, the reason I chose it is uh, very very simple. Uh, my department issued it to me. I don't really have a whole lot of choice in the matter. Uh, we can carry pretty much uh, any 45 caliber handgun that we want uh, as long as it's made by Glock and as long as it's a uh, Model 21 slim frame. So as long as those constraints are met, we can carry pretty much whatever we want. Uh, however, if we weren't required to carry this pistol, uh, this would definitely be a very, very uh, high on my list of options. Um, never had a problem with it. It's been 100% reliable. Uh, we carried the 21 before this, and I put a whole lot of rounds on it. In fact, you can see the uh, black is starting to wear off the slide on this from uh, just general use as well as carry. Uh, it's been greatly accurate and reliable. If I wasn't constrained to this, other models that I'd take a look at, though, would be the Smith & Wesson m and um, Glocks in either 9mm or 40 caliber. And uh, we've had good, good results with the uh, Springfield uh, XD pistols as well. So all of those are real good options to take a look at. I'm also a 1911 fan, but you have to be very particular when you take a look at 1911s and really know what you're looking at and what you're doing if you decide to carry a 1911 for defensive purposes. Uh, if we get good results on that, we may get into some pistol stuff uh, later on. Uh, most of our videos, we're going to try to stay focused on the precision rifle stuff, though. They call me Bad Company asks, John, can custom chopping a 700 barrel affect the performance, or better to just buy a custom one? Example, a stock Remington 700 26 inch barrel, or a gunsmith cutting down to 23 to 18 inches. Also, Manners versus McMillan. Well, to answer your first question, uh, 26 inch barrel versus cutting the barrel. Um, when you cut the barrel down, really what you're affecting is velocity. Um, you may get a little bit of an accuracy increase because a shorter barrel is slightly more rigid and resistant to the whip that you get with a longer barrel. However, it, you're not going to really see it in the kind of shooting that we do with a factory barrel. What you're going to see when you cut from a 26 inch back to a 23 is a very, very slight loss of velocity. Cutting from a 26 back to an 18, you're going to see uh, quite a significant velocity loss. Um, 18 inches is a little bit lower than I like to go. Uh, I like to stay right around 20. We touched on it in last week's uh, Mail Call Mondays. I think 20 is about perfect for a uh, tactical 308. Now, if you're shooting bench rest, you want to stay a little bit longer because you really want to push those velocities and it's not going to hurt you in the handling department. Uh, chopping down to 18 makes for a very handy rifle. If it was a law enforcement sniper rifle, I'd say even go as short as 16. Now, your Manners versus McMillan question. Uh, 
really, it, it's hard to pit them one against the other, uh, especially since uh, some of the advances that Manners has made uh, has brought them very close to the product that you get from McMillan. When you look at McMillan, the thing that really stands out is the gel coat finish and the swirl patterns in their stocks. Uh, you can specify however you want the swirls done, what percent of this color, what percent of that color, and you get some really interesting looking uh, effects. The gel coat finish is extremely durable on the, the McMillan stocks. They get scratched up, they can get buffed out and cleaned up and uh, refinished to look like brand new. Now, when you look at Manners, Manners has got quite a few uh, innovations here recently. Their mini chassis uh, provides you with a drop-in fiberglass stock. Uh, you don't have to bed it, uh, either pillar bed it or full glass bed it like you do with a McMillan to get the most out of the system. Manners has also now introduced uh, colored gel coat finishes. In the past, they were just basically a paint finish. Uh, you could specify what color you wanted to and it was a, an external finish, whereas now, they have the molded in color gel coat finishes. So it, they're getting very close to one another. I would say that you really wanna base your decision on how the stock feels to you. Um, get behind a couple of the different stocks and decide which one feels better and go with that one based on feel. Now, if you want a traditional type stock that's, that your action is gonna drop right into, you're gonna be able to bolt it right down and it already accepts a magazine system then you're going to want to look at the Manners Mini Chassis. Uh, with the Mini Chassis, when the stock arrives at your door, you just bolt in the action and slap a magazine into it and go. Um, we're going to try to see if we can get one of those uh, Mini Chassis stocks in here to give you guys a full rundown and show you uh, what all the features are on them. They're a really unique uh, idea, and it really gives you the best of the, the chassis world in a traditional stock. RDSII64 asks, what do you think about the new ALG trigger for an AR-15? Well, I don't have a whole lot of experience with the ALG triggers. In fact, I'd never even heard of them before I got this question. I went and looked them up, and they look to be a improved factory trigger, uh, just like you would find in a regular uh, GI spec semi-automatic uh, AR-15. The the parts look exactly the same, and the website states that, uh, that they're interchangeable. Now, when I say they look exactly the same, seeing the pictures and the drawings on the site, uh, the parts look the same. I haven't actually got a chance to see one in person or to feel the pull on them, so I can't really comment on that. Um, they seem to advertise on the site that it is a cleaner, uh, crisper pull than the factory uh, GI-type triggers. So it may give you a little bit of a benefit there, but I don't see any, uh, any monumental improvements. That's pretty much about all I can comment on on that trigger until I take a look at one in person. Scorpio21X asks, what sort of options are there for laser range finders outside of Leica and Swarovski that can push past 1000 meters reliably? Longer videos are more consuming to download and archive with various topics. Well, I'm not sure about the, uh, the download and archive with various topics comment. Um, we try to uh, keep the video short and sweet and to the point, but really the intent is to keep this more like a TV show rolling along than it is a, uh, a specific divided up uh, answer to each single question. Now, in answer to your question on range finders, um, the, the thing with range finders is there are a few of them out there that will range past a thousand meters, but when you start getting down into the smaller targets, they have problems. Uh, ranging buildings, hillsides, rocks, trees, that kind of stuff, uh, there are quite a few out there that will do just fine. When you start getting down to trying to range people or animals at extended ranges, then you start getting past the, uh, the eye safe stuff into the military gear. Now, um, Vectronix has a new model out called the Terrapin, which has been getting uh, very good results. I've not personally handled one yet. Uh, we just got a new model from uh, Bushnell, the Elite 1600 ARC, which uh, we've been getting good results out to uh, 1600, 1700 yards uh, with this rangefinder, hitting uh, buildings, terrain faces, rocks, that kind of stuff. Um, 
I don't so much worry about being able to hit a steel target itself or a humanoid figure or an animal at extended ranges. Um, I'll generally pick out a terrain feature that's equivalent range, either a tree or a rock or a uh, berm, something of that nature, and I'll bounce the laser off of that and it gives me a better return. Um, the Bushnell, we're going to be going into an in-depth review on it, but it has a couple of interesting modes in it that allow you to, to discriminate the target that you're aiming at versus the background or the target versus some foreground clutter, branches, that kind of thing. Um, it's a really interesting unit, also has a built-in ballistic calculator in it, and uh, we'll get to that kind of thing. This is going to be on the bottom end of the price range for a rangefinder that can get out that distance. This comes in cheaper than the Swarovski rangefinders, and uh, it's actually been functioning very, very well. Now, I don't still have the Swarovski laser guide to do a side-by-side -side comparison on these two, but there was only one target that I could hit with the Swarovski when I had it, that when I did a subsequent follow-up test and tried to hit with the Bushnell that it wasn't able to, and that was a concrete wall at approximately 2,000 yards away. Um, I haven't been able to get any returns with the Bushnell at 2,000 yards. However, the return on those uh, features with the Swarovski was limited at best. I don't know if I'd really trust the, the range that it was giving me because it was hit or miss. Um, everything else uh, from 17 in, uh, the Bushnell was able to hit and return very quickly on. So I've been fairly impressed with this unit and can't wait to get a full review out for you. Uh, if you have the cash to spend, check out the Vectronics Terrapin. Lakers33 UIV asks, can you speak to why custom rifle makers almost exclusively build their rifles on Remington style actions? There are certainly smoother actions out there such as the Tika or Sako actions, but obviously these guys have a good reason for choosing Remington. What's the appeal? Well, I think the major uh, appeal to them is that they're time proven actions, they're recognized by the vast majority of shooters, and Custom makers are really going to bow to what their customers want. So if the vast majority of customers are requesting Remingtons, then they're going to stick with Remingtons. Um, there are quite a few more Remington 700 pattern custom actions out there than there are just about anything else. And to go along with that, there are accessories, triggers, magazine systems, bolts, bolt handles, safeties, all that stuff, all based on Remington 700 pattern actions. Um, since you have all that extra stuff out there, then it seems to be a self-feeding cycle. Since you have all the parts available, if you're a new guy getting ready to bring out a custom action, then it only makes sense to bring it out based on the Remington 700 pattern. Um, there are quite a few rifles out there that are smoother than a factory Remington 700, but when you get into the custom actions such as Surgeon or Stiller or uh, Templar, those kind of actions are extremely smooth. Um, they are made to much higher tolerances than the Remingtons are, so you get a little bit better quality. You really can't compare a custom action to a Remington factory action. So I believe that's why they tend to stick with the Remington 700 pattern. Not necessarily the Remington 700 actions, because just about every custom maker out there is building their top level signature series rifle on a custom action. I don't see a whole lot of them that are building their, their top-end rifles on a factory Remington 700. GIZ4190 asks, I'm just starting to get into long-range target shooting thanks to your insight and budget build project, making things a lot easier. I'm wondering if you'll be touching base on how you reload your ammunition, best tools and practices to use. There are a few videos, but you have lots of good tips and tricks that I know I can trust. I'm glad you feel you can trust our tips and tricks. We will be doing a reloading video here soon. Um, it, again, it's going to be tactical rifle reloading. It's not going to be bench rest reloading or national match reloading. It's going to be stuff that I've found that turns out ammunition that's capable of winning tactical matches. Um, it may not win your local bench rest match. It may not be the most accurate ammunition in the world, but it's ammunition that is more accurate than factory ammunition for the rifle system that I'm making it for. And, more importantly, it's cheaper, which allows me to shoot more often. 
So we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, I promise it's going to be soon. I can't tell you exactly when we're going to get into that because we keep having stuff show up here to review. And sometimes we get stuff to review that is based on a timeline and we have to get back to the manufacturer. So that pushes other stuff back just a little bit. Uh, it's one of the reasons we haven't done our cleaning video yet because I have a pile of stuff sitting here that uh, needs to get videoed and reviewed. Daniel's Horsemanship asks, I'm looking for a bullet for a thousand yard shooting. I'm looking at 308 or 300 win. What do you think is the best? I also, for the 308, I'm looking at the Les Bear 308. Just wondering what you think about the bullet and the Les Bear rifle. I'm more of a pistol shooter, but I know I'm getting into long range shooting. Thanks and thank you for your videos. Well, Daniel, I'm not real sure if uh, by asking for bullets for 300 or 300 Win Mag, if you're talking about the actual bullet itself or the cartridge. If you're talking about the cartridge and you're going for a thousand yard shooting, the 300 Win Mag is the superior cartridge. Uh, it fires a higher ballistic coefficient bullet faster than the 308. Uh, higher BC bullets will get there faster, they'll get there with less wind drift, and that means wind's going to affect you less on the target and get you tighter groups, more accurate first round impacts. Now, if you are talking about bullets for the 308, then stick with the 155 grain uh, CNRs, the 178 grain Hornady Boattail Hollow Points, uh, 175 grain Sierras. Those are all very good uh, thousand yard bullets for the 308. If you're getting into the 300 Win Mag, then the 208 A Max is a very good bullet to use. Has a really high ballistic coefficient, and you can get it up to a pretty good speed. Um, the disadvantage of 300 Win Mag, if you are just getting into long range precision shooting, is you're going to burn barrels out much faster than a 308. You're also going to have to deal with a higher level of recoil, and it's generally not going to be conducive to you shooting a whole lot. The ammo, I'm sorry, the ammunition is going to be quite a bit more expensive for 300 Win Mag, and you have fewer choices for match loads for the 300 Win Mag. You're almost going to have to reload to get the most out of that cartridge. So, if you're trying to decide between getting into long range shooting with 308 or getting into long range shooting with a 300 Win Mag, I have to say go with the 308. Ballistically, it is a lesser cartridge than the 300 Win Mag, but you're not going to be needing the advantage of the 300 Win Mag when you're learning. It's going to be more important that you learn to pull the trigger and the fundamentals of marksmanship without, de without developing a flinch or burning out your barrel before you get there. Now on the Les Bear 308, I actually have never seen one in person, never actually shot one. Uh, looking over their specs on the Les Bear page, uh, it looks like a very competent package. They sit in a Bell & Carlson stock, they use a stiller action, which are both proven components, and more importantly, they have a 10-shot half MOA guarantee. So I would say that a 10-shot half MOA rifle is going to be a very capable platform for you to learn with. Now there are other options of course, if you go to GA Precision's homepage, uh, they have quite a few rifles on there. Surgeon Rifles also builds some very nice rifles. So um, continue to shop around, don't get stuck on one single rifle. Uh, I've seen GA Precision Rifles and Surgeon Rifles both uh, win tactical matches and work very well uh, out in the real world. So those are some options to also take a look at. Ragam asks, John, what's your opinion on molly-coated bullets? Well, I've never actually used molly because on a 308, I don't see there being a whole lot of advantages to it. Um, molly is generally used to increase your velocity and increase your barrel life. And the 308, you already have uh, such an extended barrel life unless you really go crazy pushing things fast. Um, and I usually push my uh, 308 rounds at uh, 2600, sometimes a little bit over that. Um, the stuff that I'm running through my AI, I'm pushing 178 grain uh, Boattail hollow point to about 2700 foot per second. So I, I don't mess with the Molly uh, just because it's an added step to Molly coat bullets. Um, I have talked to shooters who use Molly and I 
I don't really care to get into the, the added uh, cleaning issues and only shooting molly bullets and all the associated stuff. Now in researching the 243 build that I'm working on, I've uh, started to read about HBN. Uh, HBN coatings uh, seem to offer very similar uh, benefits to molly without some of the drawbacks such as the, uh, the application, uh, the molly coming off, the bullets on your fingers. Uh, the uh, hygroscopic properties of the molly and uh, some of the cleaning issues. So I, I think I would skip over uh, molly right now and take a look at the HBN stuff. I haven't personally used it, but I can uh, pretty much guarantee you as soon as I get a new uh, 243 barrel in here, I'm going to be running uh, HBN coated 115s through it to see how well they perform. On Facebook, Sean Poppert asks, Mail Call Monday question, any recommended reading for people just entering precision rifle shooting? Well, unfortunately here lately, I don't get enough time to read as I would really like, but I've toyed with the idea of putting a book review section up on our website. Um, one of the books that I uh, have read here recently, I actually met the author and discussed some things with him, is uh, John Simpson. He wrote a book called The Sniper's Notebook. Um, this is actually a fairly interesting book because he goes in and uh, debunks some of the myths that have been floating around, um, notably the, uh, the one minute angle for every uh, 20 degree rule. Uh, he goes into some of the differences between uh, military and law enforcement snipers and just generally uh, some very interesting reading. Um, I highly suggest you check it out. We'll put a link in the comment section below to where you can find his book. Um, very interesting uh, person. John knows what he's talking about. He's been a military sniper instructor for quite some time and uh, taught some very deadly people uh, how to do their craft. Book that has been highly recommended to me, but I haven't actually got into it yet. Obviously, it's sitting right here, is uh, Rifle Accuracy Facts by Harold Vaughn. Uh, goes into some of the uh, some of the factors that make an accurate rifle. Um, a lot of us talk about stuff all the time, you know, what makes an accurate rifle, what you need to do to get the most accuracy out of it. And hopefully reading through here will give me a little bit more insight to it. As I said, I haven't gotten into it. It's been recommended to me by quite a few different people. So I'll leave a link to it on Amazon. You guys can go and check out some of the reviews and decide for yourself. Uh, once I get through it, I'll come back and let you know if it's good to go or not. But as I said, don't get a lot of time to read here lately, so it may be a while before I get to that. One that I'm about halfway through now is the Win Book for Rifle Shooters by uh, Linda K. Miller and Keith Cunningham. Uh, this is more towards high power shooters. It goes into a lot of stuff about wind flags and things of that nature. Um, but it's still got a lot of stuff that uh, precision rifle shooters can use. Uh, with our sport, being able to make an accurate wind call is going to make the difference between a first place finish or a 15th place finish. Uh, wind is everyone's uh, Achilles heel. It is really something that I have to stay on top of because when you go to a different location, the wind may blow differently and have different characteristics than it does on your home range. Um, everywhere you go, the wind is just a little bit different. And being able to pick up on those things, um, any little tips or tricks that you can get help out. So any book you can come across on wind reading is going to be good to look into. Um, as I said, this is more geared towards high power shooters, but it's still got information that precision rifle and tactical shooters can use. So that gives you a couple of options to uh, go out there and take a look at. Uh, definitely read the reviews on the books and make an educated decision on your own. Um, I really wish I could read more, but just don't have the time right now. Michael Gibbons sent us a uh, message on Facebook and Twitter somebody that actually uses Twitter, said there wasn't enough room in Twitter to go into detail, but my question's about rifle scopes. Mil-mil versus mil-MOA versus MOA-MOA, etc. 
I don't know why manufacturers don't just produce the matching scopes these days. Seems easier. We're metric here, so I've ordered mil mil. Haven't used it yet, but hopefully it's easy. Well, Michael, um, first of all, thanks for actually kicking over to Twitter and sending us a question um, and then repeating it on Facebook. I'll make sure we're guaranteed to get it. Uh, the, the thing is, most tactical scope manufacturers nowadays uh, do make mill mill based scopes. Um, even some of the really lower end ones have started doing it. I noticed even BSA has a mill mill scope in their lineup. Uh, you won't see a whole lot of uh, minute of angle scopes in the, the lower ends. Uh, you see them in the top end scopes, uh, Night Force, US Optics, uh, etc. They, they offer MOA versions. Vortex offers an MOA version. Um, but I think Mill Mill is, uh, is really where it's at. Um, mills really don't have anything to do with metric. Uh, mill is an angular measurement. It ends up being um, one meter at a thousand meters, one yard at a thousand yards. Um, so it just, it, it's one one thousandth. Uh, it, it doesn't really end up being metric. I know that's kicked around all the time. Some scopes even have uh, metric markings on the side of them. But just try to, try to get out of your head that a mill is a metric measurement because it's not. Uh, it can still be used effectively with a uh, English system of measure or with a metric system of measure. Uh, I do think that you made the right choice with the mill mill scope. I think you're going to find it easier to use. Um, so, you know, although I've taught, learned, and think in an English system of measurement, I still find mill mill scopes easier to use than uh, minute angle based scopes. So, if you're on the fence out there, if anybody else is on the fence out there about MOA based or mill based, I, I really think you ought to take a solid look at the mill based scopes and we're going to get into some scope theory uh, videos a little bit later and really go into depth into the differences between the two when you get into using them. Michael Langley asks, great job on the mail call videos. Would love to see a segment on precision optics. What do you consider the best optic with regards to clarity and light transmission? Well, as I said, we are going to get into an optic-based video uh, a little bit later on. As far as best, I really don't like to get into best because what's best for me may not be best for you. Um, it doesn't matter if what I think the best scope out there is if you can't afford it or if it doesn't suit your purposes. Um, what is the best set of options for a tactical or a law enforcement shooter may not necessarily be what the best set of options are for a pure paper punching target shooter. Um, then you've got the average guy in between that just plinks at stuff on the weekends and he may not need to drop that three to four thousand dollars on a Schmidt and Bender scope uh, just to do what he does. So there really isn't a best for everybody. Now, as far as the clarity question, I don't really like to get into the uh, clarity or color or sight picture debate because I've been doing photography long enough to know that when I compose and edit and color grade a photo, what I like may not be what you like. When you look at different scopes with different contrast levels and different brightness, um, one scope may appear brighter than the other, but the other scope may have better contrast and better color reproduction. That doesn't mean that one scope is better than the other. It just means that it looks differently to my eye. It may not look differently to your eye. I've had people get behind scopes that I saw a distinct difference that they didn't see a difference at all. So I'm going to try to stay away from that because I don't have any way to objectively measure the difference between them. Um, I've just recently bought a camera bracket that allows me to slap a camera on the back of a rifle scope. Hopefully this is going to allow us to get a little bit more standardized pictures through the rifle scopes. Um, when we get scopes through here, they don't stay very long. I'll usually get them for a month or two and then they go back out the door. So it's difficult to do a side-by-side -side comparison unless it's a scope that I actually own. Um, several of the scopes I do own, and I generally try to bring them out as a quality control when I'm going back and forth between the two, but I can't assign a number or really assign a value 
to the, uh, the clarity or the brightness without some kind of instrument to measure it. It just wouldn't be fair and it wouldn't give you guys an accurate uh, idea of the difference between the two. Luke Elter asks, how do you like your Vortex Razor and how's it been holding up as far as durability? Well, Luke, I've got the Razor sitting right here. Um, it has, uh, up until two days ago, it was still riding on uh, Accuracy International. I just pulled it off so we can do some uh, scope tests of some other optics. So far, the scope has worked excellently. It's tracked true. Uh, we haven't had any issues with durability at all. Um, the scope has taken a, a pretty good beating. Uh, bounced it across the concrete once unintentionally. Uh, it was just a matter of I had the rifle lean against the table while I cut some case foam. Uh, knocked the rifle off and it hit every turret on the way down. It actually uh, hit on one, rolled, hit the other one. So I hit both elevation windage and parallax turrets. They've got a little bit of rash on the edges of them. But other than that, it worked fine. I actually did that right before I flew cross country to a match. And when I got there, uh, the zero was still perfect. The rifle shot great. Uh, placed decently in the match, not as high as I would have liked to have placed, but uh, placed decently. The only issue that I've even run into with it is the illumination turret. Um, if you leave it on, it seems to drain the battery fairly quickly, so you have to be real careful when you slide it into the bag that you don't catch that uh, illumination turret and roll it, or that you're uh, not a dumbass like me and you leave it turned on and throw it in a bag. I've done that a time or two, so carry extra batteries in my data book to drop in there. The uh, performance of the scope has been excellent. I really like the reticle in here. Um, again, I'm going to try to do a full review on it here soon, but when we get new scopes in, like we've got a Night Force sitting here and an HDMR, uh, those are on a ticking clock. They have to go back soon. Uh, this is a scope I own, so there's really no time crunch for me to get the review done on this one. Um, I do have a web review done on our website. We'll post that link down below. Uh, go take a look at the web review and read up on it. Um, but as far as video review, hopefully we'll get to it sometime in the next couple of months, but no promises. R. Futch asks, Will any custom stainless barrel give you generally higher velocities than its factory counterpart, or are there other factors to consider? Well, there are quite a few other factors to consider. Um, the main one being how the barrel was rifled and how the barrel was finished. Um, factory barrels, for instance, uh, factory Remington barrels are hammer forged. Um, they're banged out on a mandrel. Um, a high quality premium barrel is usually gonna be cut rifled or button rifled, some of them are button rifled, and then it's gonna be hand lapped. Um, that means they're going to take a lead slug, they're going to cover it with lapping compound, and they're going to run it through the barrel to polish out all the tooling marks. What you end up with is a very fine polished surface, uh, as opposed to a hammer forged barrel or a uh, regular button rifled barrel that is not a premium barrel. It's going to have a lot of tooling marks in it. Um, it's going to be fairly rough when you fire that bullet through it. The, the rough surface is going to grab and peel at parts of the bullet jacket. Uh, obviously, this causes more drag and this lowers velocity. So the finish has a lot to do with the velocity difference between the two barrels. The other side of things is the way it's chambered. Um, the chamber and the throat will have a drastic difference on the pressure that you're seeing when you fire around. Pressure and velocity are tied hand in hand. I think that barrel material is way on the end of the spectrum. I'm not a metallurgist, I'm not an engineer, so I can't tell you specifically if there are properties between the two, but for our purposes and the variance in factory ammunition or even our hand-loaded ammunition, I believe you're going to see more out of the finish of the bore and the way it's been chambered. On AR-15, Hunterboy56 asks, Lone Wolf, what's your opinion on neck sizing versus full length sizing when reloading for a precision bolt gun? Will just neck sizing really make enough of a difference for a long range hunting and target rifle? Thanks for the time you put into this. 
Well, there are three different types of sizing that I'm going to touch on here real quick. The first is full length sizing. That's when you set your die per the instructions that was included with it. You're going to take your fired piece of brass, throw it in there, and run it up into the die and back down. Uh, the die is then going to crunch the brass down to a size that will allow it to function in the widest variety of firearms. This is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, most factory chambers, when you fire them, the brass tends to blow out a little bit oversized. When you're resizing it back down, you're smashing it back to a smaller diameter. This expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting over time, uh, work hardens the brass, it makes it brittle, it's going to crack and fail quicker. Um, the second type of sizing I'm going to touch on is neck sizing. Uh, when you neck size a round, you have either a bushing die or a collet die that all it does is come down and take the neck diameter where the bullet fits in and smash it back down tight enough to hold your bullet. Now neck sizing is beneficial because you're not pushing the shoulder of the round back um, every time you resize it. That pushing the shoulder back and moving it forward is what causes the brass to strain, work harden, and become brittle. Uh, one of the disadvantages of neck sizing is, since you're only sizing the neck, your round is going to chamber harder and harder every time on subsequent firings. You're eventually going to get to the point where it's really difficult to lock that bolt down on a round. What folks generally do after they do that is they'll go back and they'll full length size it again and then move forward from there. Now in the middle is what they call bumping the shoulder. Basically you're going to take a full length sizing die and you're going to back it off so that when you run your brass up in you're just moving the shoulder back far enough for it to reliably chamber and you're sizing the neck back down to hold the bullet. Now bumping is what I like to do on the vast majority of my brass especially with semi-auto rifles. Um, this way I can keep the rifle functioning reliably, keep the round chambering with the same amount of force every time no matter I'm on my first firing or my 25th firing. Um, 25th is a little bit of an exaggeration. My first firing or my eighth firing, um, the round is going to chamber with the same amount of force. Um, as far as if it's going to make a difference, um, I've had full length size ammunition that has shot well within my requirements for match shooting. Um, I've had neck sized ammunition that fired extremely well. I would say that if pure accuracy is your goal, then I would neck size. Um, if you need it to function reliably, then make sure you're bumping that shoulder back. I don't think you need to go all the way to doing full length sizing, but you want to make sure you're bumping the shoulder back a couple thousandths from what your fired cases are in order to reliably chamber every time. Um, if you aren't real sure about what I'm talking about, just hang tight. We're going to do a video. You'll be able to see what I'm talking about then. On Twitter, Stephen Naismith asks, Hello from Scotland. Does the 1 in 10 twist on the AAC SD have an effect on bear life compared to the 1 in 12? Uh, I believe that you are probably getting a little bit more wear on the 1 in 10 twist versus the 1 in 12 just because you're turning that barrel a little bit faster. Obviously, physics are at play here. The barrel or the bullet um, is going to require more for, more force to turn faster, so that in turn is going to mean more friction on the rifling and the bore. However, uh, it's very possible to go 10,000 rounds on a 308 before you wear the barrel out. So, is it really going to make a difference? Uh, I would say that. Outside of laboratory conditions, you're not going to see a difference between a 1 in 12 and a 1 in 10 twist barrel. Um, you are going to see more of a variation in the way the barrels are produced than the impact of the different twist rates. Imagination asks, please explain optimum sight picture scope power for a target at any given distance. Am I the first to tweet? Well, thank you for actually using Twitter. Uh, no, you're not the first to tweet. Uh, a couple of guys beat you in just a little bit, but uh, a lot of them tweeted just to tweet. Um, 
As far as sight picture, sight picture is going to vary on what you want to accomplish. Uh, generally, if I find myself trying to engage small targets at long range, I crank the magnification up. Uh, if I'm attempting to hit multiple targets, even at long range, and I have to transition quickly from target to target, then I'll crank the power down until I can see a wider field of view, but still retain the precision needed to hit the size of target that I'm aiming at. Now, when I have to engage moving targets, moving targets, the power that I run it on is generally 10 power, unless I'm really trying to hit them at extended ranges for uh, 500 yard movers, I like to be at 10 power, uh, just because that gives me a good field of view to see the entire range of area where the target may come up, but it still gives me the accuracy required to identify the target and to see my mill scale well enough to be able to lead the target accurately. Now when you get into uh, snap targets and movers, you have to keep in mind the area that your target may come up in. Uh, it does absolutely no good to have that scope cranked up on 24 power covering 5 foot of the berm and have a target come up well outside your field of view and not being able to engage it. So while higher power may give you a little bit better shot placement, um, it is not going to help you out. It's not going to be your friend when you have to move quickly between target to target or when you have to rapidly find a target. So take a look at what you're seeing through your scope and adjust it based upon your needs, what you need your field of view to be and what you need your uh, precision to be. Michael asks, thanks for putting the show on and for your service. Do you shoot precision with suppressors? Is there one you like to use? And as a follow-up, do you shoot suppressors with threaded or QD? How do you pick one? Thanks again for your advice. Well, Michael, thanks for the question. Um, Right now, I don't run a suppressor on my match rifle, and it's mainly because the suppressors that I have here are 223 and 22. I don't have a 308 can in house right now. Um, I've been dragging my feet on which one I am looking at choosing. Um, I've still got some uh, some more research and some more people to talk to, but I'll take you through what I look for when I'm trying to figure out which can I'm going to go with. First and foremost is the result of accuracy on the weapon system. Um, it does me absolutely no good to have no point of impact shift and excellent sound suppression if it causes the accuracy to open up a little bit. If it degrades the accuracy of the weapon system, it does me no good at all. Um, on a precision rifle, I think sound suppression is kind of long down the list. Um, first and foremost is accuracy. Second after that, if you're going to use a quick detach, uh, quick installation suppressor, then you need to know when you screw the suppressor back on that your point of impact shift from unsuppressed to suppressed is repeatable. Um, you obviously don't want to have a massive shift, but if you have a small shift and it's repeatable, then you're going to be able to compensate for that very quickly. Um, if you have a wandering point of impact every time you install that can, that's going to cause you problems. So you want to make sure it comes right back to zero when you lock that can on or right back to a repeatable point when you lock that can on. Uh, sound suppression is third on the list. Obviously we buy cans because we want the weapon system to be quiet. We want it to be a low signature weapon after that. However, as I mentioned, if it degrades the accuracy of the system, you don't know where that first shot's gonna go, then it's really not worth anything to us even if it makes the rifle extremely quiet. The whole purpose of a precision rifle is high degree of accuracy and to be able to get that first shot where you want it, when you want it. Now as far as thread on versus uh, a quick detach device, um, on my 223s I have a uh, thread over brake type design quick detach. Uh, it allows me to get the can off relatively quickly. Um, however, I would much prefer one of the quarter turn quick releases as long as again we have the repeatability there. Uh, if you're going to have a rifle that you're going to mainly put the can on and leave the can on it, uh, go ahead and just do a regular threaded barrel. Um, you save a little bit of money that way and you know a thread protector is very quick to screw on if for some reason you want to run it unsuppressed. Now if you're going to constantly be taking the can on and off the weapon system then some kind of quick detach is nice because it saves wear and tear on the threads on the barrel 
and it prevents the uh, possibility of cross-threading it or getting those threads really messed up. As a side benefit, uh, most of the quick detach uh, type deals don't require any kind of thread protector. Once you uh, detach the can, uh, the locking device is robust enough that you're not going to worry about nicking a thread and messing everything up. So given the option, I go for a quick detach. Uh, plus a lot of the companies out there now, uh, their quick, de quick release devices serve dual purposes. They're either a flash suppressor or a brake as well. So when you remove the can, you have some added functionality if you're required to shoot without a can on. Say you're traveling to a state that, uh, that suppressors are illegal, then you still have the ability to uh, have some recoil absorption or some uh, flash suppression. Well, that's all we have for this show. Hopefully it hasn't run too long for you, and hopefully the uh, index down in the description will help you out. Please remember to read the stuff we put down there in the description. Um, we try to put a lot of helpful links in there and uh, some other descriptions on our other videos. So always read the descriptions underneath the videos. Um, as always, we cannot continue the show without your questions. Send us your questions in the comments section below or on Facebook or Twitter. This time you guys have actually utilized Twitter, so I think we'll uh, keep it up. And remember, if you like the video, please click the like button below. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Subscribing is free and it helps our numbers. Helping our numbers helps get us more products to review and helps us keep on here talking to you. Um, thank you and keep sending us your questions. Still watching? If you're on YouTube and you're watching us and you see over here in the other mail call video type things, um, the deal with that Transformer kid, that's not me. The Transformer guy and I are not the same, don't know each other. I have no idea how this stuff gets over here. Um, the Modern Warfare MW3 Call of Duty stuff, I that's not me either. No idea how that keeps getting up there. I, honestly, I don't even own an Xbox. Um, so that's not us. This is us. Click our channel. Check out other videos. Thanks.